We'll take a look at gases today. This is the material for exam three. And it's just this chapter. Um, okay. First thing you'll notice is the slides are not taken from the publisher. These slides were created freelance. <clears throat> so, what's a gas? I mean, we talked about that early on, the difference between gases, liquids, and solids. Probably the defining characteristic of gases is the fact that they're uh, virtually independent particles in a space. They are matter. I mean, they occupy space and they have mass. But we can largely treat the particles in a gas as independent actors. They do interact occasionally. But in the beginning, we're going to treat them like a bunch of billiard balls. In other words, when they do smack into each other, that's all they do. They just hit and bounce off. And then later on, um, this semester, maybe the next semester, we get into more details about how those particles interact when they do approach one another, because that will, that will cause deviations from ideal behavior. But for now, we're going to treat them as independent particles. All right, they are moving very fast. And some calculations that we do, I think, later in this slide set shows us that they're moving pretty close to, well, many of the gases, uh, elemental gases are moving pretty close to the speed of sound. If you, if you look at individual atoms or molecules in the gases. All gases completely dissolve in one another. So when we talked about early on the homogeneous mixture, gases, when you mix two or more gases together, they always form homogeneous mixtures or solutions. In fact, we're breathing a solution right now, mostly nitrogen and oxygen. So since they're moving really fast, and each of the atoms or molecules uh, has mass, then each atom or molecule in that gas has kinetic energy. All you need for kinetic energy is mass and velocity. But we have to treat them. The problem is we don't have the ability to track every atom or every molecule in a gas. I don't know of anybody that can do that. So we have to treat them as uh, being in random motion. We have to treat them as statistically speaking. In other words, uh, some sort of a, an average of behavior for the whole gas. So some of them might be moving really fast and some might be moving slower. You get a distribution. And we use that value, which we're going to calculate later, to say what's the average kinetic energy for the gas. Okay. Then we're going to look at uh, gas laws. In other words, um, these actually mathematical expressions describe the behavior of gases and they came in sequence the laws came and then we uh, gathered enough information this is historically speaking we gathered enough information where we felt confident or at least one scientist felt confident in proposing a theory of why the gases obey these laws so we're going to look at those laws and then we're going to look at the theory behind them And like I mentioned earlier, um, in the beginning, we're going to treat gases in an ideal sense, um, recognizing that there are deviations. Uh, then we're going, to, they we're going to try to understand how these gas equations can be rearranged to solve problems. 
and how some of them actually can be combined into a single equation to help us solve problems. Okay, I mentioned we were breathing a solution of gases, uh, which happen to be necessary for life. For us, the most important gas in this mixture is oxygen. But for many plants, the most important gas in that mixture is nitrogen. Because they will certain plants uh, have the ability with through symbiotic relationships with microorganisms can take nitrogen and what we call fix it into a form that can be used by the plant. Um, dinitrogen is a very stable molecule. It takes a lot of energy to break that thing apart. It can't be used by plants, not that way. So the microorganisms take that and through a series of enzymatically controlled reactions, they produce either this one or that one, typically. Makes it available to the plant. So in some form or fashion, both of the major gases in the, in the atmosphere are necessary for life. And um, of course, the pollutants that we see in the atmosphere, many of them are gases themselves. I mean, EPA has been trying to label carbon dioxide as a pollutant for years. And unfortunately, they haven't succeeded. Uh, I don't know if they're just power hungry or they're just ignorant or just plain stupid. Because carbon dioxide is one of the other gases that's necessary for life. Right? Green plants, in particular, take carbon dioxide and fix it into simple sugars to begin with, and then they build it into other molecules. So for them, carbon dioxide is food. And the more carbon dioxide you have in the atmosphere, the better for them. That's been demonstrated in, in the uh, growth chamber, uh, greenhouse experiments, even some uh, field experiments have proven that you increase carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, you get more plant production. <clears throat> uh, some of those pollutants, though, are, are not gases. They're suspended particulates. And those can be a problem. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on global warming because it's predominantly a myth. <clears throat> and uh, it takes somebody who, who practically failed science courses in college to uh, put that on the world stage by the name. It's initial for Al Gore. <laughs> so we know what he's after. Um, so I'm not going to waste a whole lot of your time on that topic. But if I do happen to get up on my sock, soapbox, I hope you'll forgive me. All right. So, um, the investigation of gases, historically speaking, was uh, followed developments in technology. Uh, early on, gases were very easy to work with uh, because the technology allowed you to do that. And one of those technologies was measurement of pressure. Once um, a reliable, quantitatively um, uh, lost my train of thought. Calibrated, excuse me. Quantitatively calibrated devices could be used and reproduced throughout the, the scientific community. Then pressure was investigated. Uh, of course, volume preceded that. Uh, volume was easy to measure. Okay, so <clears throat> um, we're going to talk about the device that was that allowed uh, investigations of pressure, but we need units of measure also, some standard form. <clears throat> um, that device was the barometer. Now, when the uh, international system was developed, 
uh, scientists were already measuring pressures in various units. Some of those were uh, in slippery zone atmospheres. So we would take um, air pressure at sea level. The average air pressure at sea level is one atmosphere, and everything else was um, measured, calibrated according to that. Um, the problem with this one is all the standard, the uh, fundamental units for the SI could not easily be translated into atmospheres. In other words, you needed conversion factors that had to be empirically determined. So uh, another unit of measure was, was proposed called the Pascal. And it was named in honor of a uh, Frenchman by the name of Pascal. <clears throat> okay, let's look at what pressure really is. Pressure, and, and this actually is more physics than it is chemistry. Pressure is a force applied per unit area. Okay. So, and that force is going to be measured in newtons, and the area is going to be in square meters based upon SI fundamental units. So this is a derived unit. Pressure is a derived unit, and it would have these units of measure. <clears throat> So anytime you can express uh, a force per unit area, you can uh, describe a pressure. Notice also that uh, this, have I discussed um, uh, extensive versus intensive properties? Can I repeat it? Extensive property is, is anything that describes uh, is a quantity that changes with the amount of substance. So mass would be extensive. The more mass you have, the bigger the number. Intensive properties are those expressions of quantity that don't change with the amount of something you have. And pressure is one of those intensive properties. Uh, in other words, when you have a pressure of uh, one atmosphere, or whatever the equivalent is here, then uh, it doesn't matter what surface area is uh, receiving that air pressure. It's still one atmosphere, no matter how big or how small the area. <clears throat> okay. So along comes Evangelista Torricelli. He was an Italian. In the middle 17th century, invented a device that could easily be used to measure air pressure. He called it the barometer. And all he had to do was he take, by this time, uh, glass blowers were very, very good at producing uniform diameter tubing. So he got a glass blower, well, he may have produced it himself, I don't know. Uh, he, somehow he got a tube made and he sealed it off at one end and filled it with, he could have filled it with any liquid. Uh, he probably did some calculations and found that if he filled it with water, um, the atmosphere would support a column about 33 feet long. So that was a little excessive. They said, give me something denser. Well, the densest liquid we know is mercury. So he filled it with mercury. That way it only had to be about, uh, well, 760 millimeters, 76 centimeters long. So what did he do? We had to turn the open end up first and filled it with mercury and then put his thumb over it. And then he inverted it and submerged it in a bowl of mercury and then turn it loose. They didn't know about mercury poison back then. <laughs> of course, liquid mercury, met metallic mercury is not that dangerous. It's, it becomes dangerous when it's vaporized and it has a fairly low vapor pressure for metal. You breathe it in, it gets in, stays in. 
um, or if it's converted to an organic, usually by microbial activity. Uh, methyl or dimethyl mercury is extremely toxic. I, mean, it, I could tell you a horror story, but we don't have time. <laughs> anyway, uh, so he, he created this barometer, filled it with mercury, and he noticed that uh, when he released his thumb, what happened to the column of mercury? It didn't stay up there. Right? It dropped. The column of mercury dropped. Well, uh, not only was he inventing a device to measure air pressure, because air pressure is bearing down here and pushing up there, it's, it's holding that column up. What's up here? Virtually nothing. There might be a few mercury atoms floating around, but for all intents and purposes, that was the first vacuum. There was something there, now there's not. That's a vacuum. And he noticed that um, if he just set it out on his desk and left it there and just measured it day after day after day, he noticed that the column of mercury would go up and down. And he noticed a trend between that movement and the weather. So when it started to drop, um, he could predict that bad weather's on the way. Or if it went up, bad weather's past and good weather's coming. And that still holds today. High pressure, good weather, low pressure, bad weather. But he also noticed that if he threw it in the back of his cart and went up a mountain, um, the column dropped. Because as he gets higher in the atmosphere, there's less atmosphere above him to press down on this and hold the column up. And then if he went down the mountain, uh, just the opposite half of the column moved up. Okay, so all he had to do was measure the distance between this surface and the top of that meniscus. And in, in Mercury, the meniscus is not this way, but it's that way. <clears throat> the top of that meniscus, and you could you could say something about air pressure in terms of millimeters of mercury. Well, that's another unit of measure. A millimeter of mercury in a barometer. And it doesn't matter how wide the barometer or how big the pool, this measurement is an intensive property. Doesn't matter how much you have or what the surface area is. So one atmosphere is actually equal to 760 millimeters of mercury in that barometer. I don't have one here. There's one on the Greenberg campus. I'm tempted to stay and bring it over here, but we need that would be kosher. Because these things are not real easy to transport. Okay. So after saying all of that, uh, and this is just in black and white, what I just told you, predict the weather. Okay. All right. So there we go. That's normal atmospheric pressure at sea level. And this had to be standardized because, I mean, even if you're at sea level and the weather changes, you're going to see a change in air pressure. So we had to settle on sort of a, uh, an average value. And that's where it's set, 760 millimeters, one atmosphere pressure. Oops, wrong direction. There we go. Okay, so we can calculate um, the pressure in atmospheres if we know any one of these other values, like millimeters of mercury, what if the pressure at the uh, Raleigh County Airport is 694 millimeters of mercury? Well, if these two are equal, remember what I said about equality? If you've got something equal to something else, you instantly have a conversion factor. So if we have 694 millimeters of mercury, we want to convert that to atmospheres we need something that will cancel millimeters of mercury and leave us with atmospheres, correct? 
Well, we know one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters. There you go. Those are canceled the U atmospheres. So we divide 760 into this, and obviously it's less than one, less than one atmosphere. Okay. Turns out to be 0.913 for that value. And the airport is 2,500 feet above sea level, about a half a mile. So you would expect the air pressure to always be less than one atmosphere. It'd be strange if it were greater than one atmosphere. <clears throat> and winter place, your elevation is a lot higher. It's about a thousand feet higher. Right? So your air pressure is lower. If we do the same calculation with that value, we find that it's only 0.88 atmospheres. Okay. You can go the other direction, right? If you have 1.032 atmospheres, which would be someplace probably below sea level, maybe uh, the Dead Sea or Death Valley, I think, is below sea level. You can get a value that's higher than one atmosphere. And that would be converted to millimeters of mercury, 784, which is greater than 760. So it makes sense. Okay. So we can express pressure in different ways. Here's the SI unit. Uh, oh, I erased it. But the standard unit for force is the Newton. And the standard unit for area is the square meter. So one Newton per square meter is one Pascal. Um, if you have inches of mercury, right? Sometimes we used to use inches only. Inches of mercury was 29.92 inches of mercury is one atmosphere. 14.69 pounds per square inch is one atmosphere. Uh, 1,013 millibars is one atmosphere. Hundred and one thousand three hundred and twenty five pascals is one atmosphere. So those are all conversion factors. Right? They're all equalities. And if they're all equal to one atmosphere, then each one of these is equal to the other one. Right. So you've got a multitude of different conversion factors depending on what you need in order to do the conversion. Okay. So if we take that one and convert it into atmospheres, we might have to do a chain conversion to go from PSI to atmospheres and then atmospheres to inches of mercury. That's, uh, yeah, so that would be inches of mercury. So you can do this dimensional analysis work, still works, even though we're in a different chapter. <clears throat> Okay, we can convert this to millibars. You just need the right conversion factor or conversion factors. And there you have 953 millibars is equal to 718 millimeters of mercury. I think millibars is, is commonly used on weather maps. Okay. Um, that's another example. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, you've got plenty of examples to work with in your review document. Uh, let's see, what are we trying to do here? Oh, all right. Convert, let's say the tube, this tube is five millimeters in diameter. And if the column is 760 millimeters high, then um, we want to calculate the pressure in one in newtons per square meter. And that can be done simply by determining what volume of mercury that is from here to here. And using the volume, then we can express we can use the density formula. 
mass per unit volume. Right? We've got volume of mercury, we've got the density of mercury, we can find out what mass that is. And um, there's a lot of math in here. That this actually, has anybody had physics in here? Physical science? No? Because you get a smatter into physics in there too. This is the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. This is the mass in kilograms of that mercury. And these are conversions. Uh, this is the, the gets you to the square meters that's represented in that column of mercury. Then you find that this is how we get a conversion factor for uh, 760 millimeters of mercury in one atmosphere is 101.3 kilopascals. That was on the previous slide. It was here. It was. 101,325 pascals or 101 kilopascals. That's where that came from. Okay. Okay, now let's talk about laws, gas laws. The first one was determined and published by Robert Boyle. He was an Englishman. And he had all the uh, equipment and standardized measurements to investigate pressure versus volume. So he said, how does pressure and volume, how are pressure and volume related for an, a trapped gas? What happens if you increase the pressure? What happens to the volume? So this would be the uh, dependent variable, the one that the experimenter changes, this would be the independent variable. His device was sort of a modification of the barometer. He used mercury, but he used a J tube. Let's see if I've got a picture. Where is it? I don't have the J tube. Maybe it's on another slide. Like this. And there like that. So open it that in, close to this end. So he just took the barometer to bend it. And if he adds mercury in here, then it will pull up on the bottom, add a little more, add a little more. When it touches the inner wall here, now that gas is trapped. So it just keeps adding and adding and adding and adding. And notice what happens over here. Well, he adds that much, but he's only got that much, that height on this side, okay? So something in here is pushing back. The trap gas is pushing back and holding that column mercury. <clears throat> so we notice that um, the difference between the height here and the height here, that difference there is a measure of the pressure on the gas that's inside that transported. And once it's trapped, there's no change in the amount of gas. It's the same gas that was in there before. And if he maintains a constant temperature, then he doesn't have to deal with that variable. Right? And these experiments will take minutes, so the temperature is unlikely to change. Or you could just submerge it in ice water, and that would maintain temperature, whatever he did. Um, probably didn't do that. That's too much trouble. Um, but in order to change the pressure, he just he made this increase. And of course, as this increases, this one increases a little bit, but not as much. There's sort of a ratio. Okay, what he noticed was that as he increased the pressure, and if you multiply that times the value of volume, it was always a constant. So as the pressure increases, the volume decreased. Anytime you get two variables as product equal to a constant, they are inversely proportional. As this one goes up, that one goes down. It has to be that way. If it's not that way, then you can't maintain that constant. 
Okay. And if we plot the data, and this is probably modern, modern recreation. First experiment, if we say, actually, this wouldn't, this might not be the first one, but if we have a pressure of 25 atmospheres and the volume is four liters, then four times 25 is 100. Okay. And we plot that. Then we decrease the pressure. So we're going backwards from the way you did it. Decrease the pressure. The volume increases to five. Five times 20 is 100. Plot that. And then we just keep doing it. As we decrease the pressure, the volume increases. We multiply them out. We see that they're still 100. Okay. And we keep plotting their data points. Okay. This is the last one. Yeah, that's the last one. Notice that if we plot them on an arithmetic scale, that's sequential, it's, that's five units, that's five units, that's five units, five. Okay, as long as it's sequential, it's, it's not one of those weird logarithmic scales or anything like that. It's arithmetic. Then when we plot those numbers, we get this curve like that. That curve in mathematics is called a hyperbola. Remember studying hyperbolas? Okay. What's characteristic of a hyperbola? These tails, this way and that way, never touch the axis, ever. They can go out to infinity, will never touch the axis. And that makes sense because if one of these goes to zero, then there's no way you can have a constant, right? Because it instantly goes to zero. So these values, no matter how big or how small they get, they have to be real numbers to give you that hyperbola. Okay. That's an inverse proportionality. As one increases, the other decreases. Okay. All right. So if we determine this constant, then we can propose other values and solve that equation. <clears throat> the problem is that it only works for that one little experiment. And you've got to solve for that K. And most experiments have such variability in them that the K won't be as pretty as that one. It won't always be like 100, 100, 100. It's going to vary. So an alternative way of solving these equations is we say, okay, so if we've got one equation, I mean, we've got one experiment set up, and we know that this pressure, that first measurement, is going to be equal to some constant. Then if we change the pressure to some other value, we get a different volume. That's also going to be equal to K, right? Right. So, um, if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A has to be equal to C. So we can just do away with the constant and say P1, B1 equals P2, B2. What you have to do when you're solving problems is be sure that you get the right numbers in here. Right? Don't put this B1 over here in B2 or you can't solve the problem. Okay, so that's that's what I call before and after. This is a before and after solution. This is before, this is after when you change one of these variables and you solve for the third one. No, the fourth one. One, two, three, four. Okay. And we're going to do that with the other gas laws too. And this is a, uh, I stands for initial and S stands for final. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because all you have to do is you can rearrange it first or you can plug the numbers in first and rearrange to solve. There. And what you'll notice is that the, the volume and the pressure values, these have to be the same units, these have to be the same units. But it really doesn't matter what the units are. Whatever units you start with are the units you're going to end with. Okay, here's another problem that we don't have a lot of time for, so I'm going to 
breeze through this one. This is solving for pressure instead of volume like we did for the previous. Okay, that was Boyle's law. Um, oh, let me let me mention this. When we're describing gases, there are four parameters that will completely describe, physically describe a gas. And the nice thing about gases is the particles, it doesn't matter what they are. They could be argon, they could be helium, they could be oxygen, nitrogen, they could be water vapor. Uh, gas doesn't care. The gas laws do not care. They work no matter what. In an ideal situation, it doesn't matter what the gas is, these laws work for everyone. As long as you account for these four factors, pressure, volume, how much of the gas there is, number of moles, and temperature. Right? So with Boyle's law, number of moles, the amount of gas, and the temperature were constant. So we can let these vary. In Charles' law, we're going to measure, we're going to uh, discuss uh, Charles, he was a Frenchman. We're going to discuss the relationship of volume and temperature. So that means that pressure has to be maintained constant and the amount of gas, the number of moles, has to be constant. So let's see, we have a picture. Uh, Jacques, his first name was Jacques. I guess that's French for Jack. <clears throat> um, he did the work in the late 1800s, but it wasn't published. He didn't publish it. It was another Frenchman, Guy Lussac, who published in the early 19th century. But he recognized that Charles' work and gave him credit for it. So now we call it Charles Law and not Gaylor Sachs Law. Gaylor Sachs did some other things and he got credit for those independently. So, um, so how would you maintain this one as constant and this one as constant? So that you can allow the volume and temperature to vary. Well, the easiest way is with a cylinder and a piston, right? The, the frictionless piston, right? We're still ideal. <clears throat> so the volume can change with this, this piston in here, and you just have a constant weight bearing down on that. Um, atmosphere is usually not enough, so we add maybe a kilogram to it. Some constant weight. And as long as you don't move it to the moon, then you're in good shape. So this volume can vary, and then we can submerge it in something, ice water or, I don't know, um, salted ice, if you can make an ice cream, and change the temperature. And change the temperature and let the volume vary, and you can measure that volume, because you have a uniform diameter cylinder, and all you have to do is know the height, and then you can multiply it by the area, and you get your volume. Okay, so um, Charles did that. And Gay Sack, I'm sure, repeated the, the process for his experiments. Well, when you increase the temperature, what do you think is going to happen to the gas? It's going to get bigger, right? You make it hotter, it pushes on that cylinder, and it's, it's a constant. Uh, force bearing down on that, that piston so it moves out. So as the temperature increases, the volume increases. That's a direct relationship, not an inverse, a direct relationship. And this is what the data looks like. At zero degrees, you get that cubic centimeters. This is a theoretical data set. Right? Keep increasing the temperature and you get more volume. Okay. So you get a straight line. And the relationship is like that. Anytime you have a, not a product, but a quotient, a quotient of two variables equal to a constant, 
that will give you a direct relationship. As this one increases, that one has to increase to maintain that constant value. Okay, there's your straight line. Um, later on, um, Kelvin, Lord Kelvin, I forget his given name, <clears throat> but he was rich enough. He had, he was independently wealthy and he could spend all his time doing experiments. <clears throat> Took this relationship and he said, what if we extended this line? Just kept going down like this. At what point would it meet the x-axis? And when it meets the x-axis, what does that mean about this? That means volume is zero. So at what temperature would the volume of the gas be zero? That's entirely theoretical because we know that individual gas molecules and atoms have a volume. So you can, they can't go to zero. But uh, it's a lengthy description. Uh, let me try to make a long story short. What he ended up with was a new temperature scale. Instead of degrees Celsius, he has a temperature scale called Kelvin. The difference in between the two is that the zero point here is zero degrees C. The zero here is 273 degrees less than that one. But the Celsius or yeah, Celsius temperatures are going to be negative. Right? And you can't do calculations with negative temperature values. So Kelvin's temperature works better because they're always positive. You start from zero and you go, you, the only way you go is up. So all those values for temperature. Whenever we talk, do calculations with temperature, we use Kelvin. Now you can you can uh, do the experiments and define the relationship with degrees Celsius, like uh, Charles and Gay Lussac did. But when you you actually use it in other calculations, it needs to be temperature always needs to be in Kelvin. Okay, <clears throat> let's see. Oh, we're gonna draw a picture. So that's what Kelvin did, and he found out that out here, about minus 273 degrees Celsius, you get zero volume. Now, this has an extra two decimals in it, but for our purposes, we're just going to hold it at 273. The calculations work out good enough for us. Okay. That was Charles' law. Now you can also solve Charles' law problems like we did with oil. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. For the same reason. That's equal to K and that's equal to K, so they're equal to each other. Okay. Then we can go through various manipulations and solve a problem. If you're going to use Charles' law exclusively, then you've got to be certain that the number of moles and the pressure do not change. That's another before and after, right? What was it before initially? What is it after? And actually, if you have after values here and you're missing one on this side, you can still solve it. I mean, it's like any math equation. If you've got one unknown, it's solvable. Okay, this just rearranges things. All right, Charles Law uh, examples. All right, so first thing we have to do is convert temperatures to Kelvin. So 25 degrees is 298, and they have the decimals in this slide. 300 is 573. Then you can put the values in there with the, the volume and solve. There we go. 96 liters. I need to work on the slide because small L is not liters. This is a big capital L is liters.
I inherited this from another teacher. And just haven't bothered to change it. Okay. Uh, the last the last two factor law that we're going to look at is Avogadro's law. And we looked at, we've seen Boyles, we've seen Charles. Avogadro is a relationship between volume and moles. So now, right, we're going to have volume and moles vary. We have to hold pressure and temperature constant. Okay, so what's the relationship? It's a direct relationship. As the number of moles increase, the volume increases. Okay. <clears throat> this also carries with it. Have I talked about the uh, Karlsruhe Congress? Okay. In the middle 1800s, um, companies were making money hand over fist. Um, a lot of it was in artificial dye. And their reactions, when they behaved, were producing product they could sell at a premium and they were making lots of money. Uh, and uh, university professors and those that were independent researchers um, were doing pretty well too. The problem was that all of their calculations, their stoichiometry, was based upon mass. And we know now that the reaction is based upon atoms and molecules not mass so when things started going wrong in the early 19th century everybody began to panic because they were losing money and their chemical engineers couldn't figure it out well <clears throat> they convened a congress at uh, Karlsruhe, university of Karlsruhe in southern bavaria germany and said, all right, we're going to figure this thing out. So they were there for a couple of weeks and everybody left just threw up their hands. We don't know what to do. We can't figure it out. Well, there was a, a young chemist there who was actually a, a, a teacher. His name was Canizaro. And uh, two Z, I think it's this way. Wow. I can't spell it. Let's leave it this. Canizaro. He was a student of Avogadro. They're both Italians. Um, and he used principles that he had learned from Avogadro concerning volume and moles. Because moles is number of particles. Right? So we're, we're heading in the right direction. He used that in a publication and he gave a talk at the Congress, which some people attended and some people didn't. Uh, but he had reprints of a uh, a referee journal publication that he had made based on those principles and he was handing them out as they were leaving. And they took them back to their companies and their universities and some of them read them and the light bulbs started going all over and said, aha, that's it. Here's the, the gist of it. Avogadro said, if you have two volumes of gases, doesn't matter what they are, as long as the volume of this one is equal to the volume of that one, and the temperature of the gas inside, those two are equal, and the pressures inside are equal. All three of those have to be equal. Then you can also say that the number of moles of gas here is equal to the number of moles of gas there. Okay, that might not seem very, Earth shaking right now, but what if these are two different gases? Then they're not going to have the same masses. They can have the same number of particles, but they'll have a different mass. That was not equal to that. Okay, why are they different masses? Because each one of those particles is a different mass. So now they have a, a way to measure the relative masses of each one of the particles because now they know that there are equal numbers of particles and then if the difference of mass is due to each one of them they can ratio the two so they've got a handle now 
on the relationship between mass and particle size and particles. Okay, so that was essentially what Avogadro was saying. And the law that was pr proposed um, later, I think this has two seconds, um, was attributed to him. Right? That he, he didn't propose it in his lifetime, but it was based upon his work, so he was given credit. So <clears throat> if we hold the pressure constant, the temperature constant, then we can say if we if we shove more moles of gas into that container, the volume is going to increase. And that same container with a frictionless piston is a good way to do it. You can hold the pressure constant, you can hold the temperature constant, and then you've got a port on the side and you can put more gas into it. Okay, so <clears throat> let's see, we're not going to draw a picture for this one, no graphs. But you can say the same thing for this one as we did before. And that's a before and after situation for Avogadro's law. And it's they're directly proportional. All right. Oh, this last part of this slide makes the point that during a chemical reaction, if the reactants and the products are all gases, then we can say this. On this side, this balanced equation said there are two moles of gas, ammonia gas here. If it decomposes and makes one mole of nitrogen and three moles of hydrogen in the process, what has changed? The number of moles of gas. So if the number of moles of gas has gone from two on this side to four on that side, what does that mean about the volume? The volume should double. It's gone from two mole reactants to four moles product. If all of these are used up, then now we have four moles of gas. And if we started off with 35 cubic feet of ammonia, we should end up with 70 cubic feet of products. It should double the volume. Okay. All right. So that we don't have to, we don't have to always hold two of them constant and let the other two vary. Sometimes all four of them can vary. <clears throat> so what do we do with that? Well, we take what we know and combine the laws together. We know that this pressure, this volume, equals this pressure times this volume. But we also know the relationship between volume and temperature. And we know the relationship between volume and moles. That's the combined gas law. You can let all of them vary as long as only one of them is unknown. If there's more than one unknown in here, then you're stuck. That's the combined gas law. All right, and this animation goes through various. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there's also, this is what I call before and after. If you know the conditions before something happens and you know the conditions after, then as long as you have one unknown, you can solve for it. But suppose you don't know the before, you just know the now. Okay. This is a, a, a state function. The, the, what is the state of the gas right now? What do you do? Well, you can't use this because you didn't know the before. But if these are equal to a constant, like both of them are equal to a constant. Then you can say, all right, what's the state? Well, pressure over volume in T equals a constant. What you need is to know what the constant is. If you know what the constant is, then all you need is, the, is three of these and you can solve for the fourth one. But if we do it that way, we have to fix the 
units of measure. The constant depends upon the units of measure. So what we're going to do in this class for now is say the pressure is in atmospheres, volume is in liters, this is moles, and this is in Kelvin. If those units of measure are used for these, then this becomes a special term called R, and it has a special value. Liter, atmospheres, your atmospheres per mole K. Now we know this value, and as long as we use these units of measure over here, then we can solve for the unknown. Okay. This is this is before after, and this is state. What is it right now? And when you're solving problems, gas problems, you look for that. Right? Is it a before and after problem, or is it a state problem? All right. Now, when we talk about the ideal gas, we have to make some assumptions. It remains a gas at all pressures and all temperatures. Right? We know that's not true right? because we have liquid carbon dioxide, dry ice. It used to be a gas, carbon dioxide. If you press it, if you pressure it and cool it, you turn it into a liquid and then you turn it into a gas. Right? So we know that gases are not ideal. But in order to use this equation, we have to assume ideal behavior. And under certain conditions, we can assume that. And those conditions, I might as well tell you now, the conditions under which these gas laws, laws work are high temperature and low pressure. And in fact, low moles. Mark. Wrong color. There it is. Okay, so while we're on the topic, what do we mean by high temperature? High temperature relative to in the Kelvin system, right, would be room temperature. 20 degrees plus 273 is 293K. That's high temperature. So these conditions are good for temperature. Room temperature is good for temperature. How about low pressure? Low pressure, one atmosphere, two, three, 10, 20 atmospheres. That's considered low. High pressure would be like 200, 500, 1,000 atmospheres of pressure. Then you start to get problems. And number of moles, one mole, two mole, three mole, 10 moles. That's the limit. Okay. So in order for the gas to be considered ideal, these things are, have to be true. Remains a gas at all pressures and temperatures. It has a point molecular volume. What does that mean? Remember in mathematics? Let me erase this. That's a point. Are there any dimensions associated with that point? No. Has no has no height, has no width, has no depth. Just a point. That means it has no volume. So that's what we mean by point molecular volume. We assume there's no volume. In other words, there's a gas there, but there isn't. <laughs> <clears throat> It does not interact with other gases. I mentioned that earlier. When they smack into each other, they act just like billiard balls. They just bounce off. Conservation of, of momentum, conservation of kinetic energy too. Right? There's no loss of kinetic energy in a, a, a collision between two gas molecules. They don't interact. They don't attract. They don't repel. Oops. One button. And of course, goes without saying, they have to obey all the gas laws. If they deviate from the gas laws, then they're not ideal. Real gases, on the other hand, 
do turn to liquid and some turn to solid when you cool them and pressure them. They do have an actual volume. The molecules in a gas do have volume. They do interact with other gases. Well, some of them don't interact, but a lot of them do. And of course, they interact with the walls of the container, but they smack the walls of the container. If they didn't do that, you wouldn't know they're there because you couldn't measure the pressure. Right? When you stick a gauge in that container, uh, if the gas doesn't interact with the gauge, how do you know something's in there? You don't. So the real gas does interact with the walls of the container. That's where pressure comes from. And this is a restatement of what I just put on the board. Low pressure, high temperature, and I added the other one, low moles. Okay, so here's the high ideal gas equation that I've already shown you. It's a combination of Boyle's Law, Charles Law, Avogadro's Law. And by the way, as notice these laws are developed sequentially in time. Boyle came along here because he had ways to measure pressure and volume very reliably. Then Charles came along later because they had to develop a reproducible, calibrating, calibratable temperature scale. Okay, so when they did that, then Charles could do his experiments. And then uh, Avogadro came along. I don't think his was so much technology related as change of mind. He thought outside the box. He wasn't thinking mass only. He was thinking in terms of numbers of particles, moles. Uh, okay. So this ideal gas equation was proposed by Emil Clapeyron. You may see that name later. There's another equation associated with Clapeyron. And there's the equation. It's usually written as PV equals NRT. So R is that constant. Pressure times volume equals moles times the constant times the temperature. Now, uh, for this chapter, we're going to be using that constant. It's in units of liter atmospheres per mole K. Later, when we start introducing energy into the mix, then we'll change the constant to units of joules per mole K. Joules is a unit of energy. And, it, and because we change the, the units, this value also changes. But we won't do that until we need to. And that should be uh, useful information. Yeah, in fact, we got a bunch of R values in there. So you gotta know which one you're looking for. Based upon the units of measure. The first one in the list is liter atmospheres per mole K. 0.08206. <clears throat> okay. Um This, is, this could be misleading. If R is not used, in other words, if you use a before and an after equation, if there's any temperature in it, the temperature has to be in Kelvin. But the pressure, the volume, of course, the moles is fixed. Pressure and volume can be any units you want, before and after. Just if you use atmospheres and you're solving for after pressure, the unit's going to come out as atmosphere. But the temperature always has to be in K. Okay, and you can arrange the equation in a whole host of different ways. Depending on what you're solving for. And there are a couple of problems in there, I think, where you actually combine the ideal gas equation with some other equation, like the one for density. And we'll, um, we'll review these on Tuesday.
because Thursday's the exam. And that uh, Boyle's Law problem uh, at lab we're going to do on Tuesday. So you need to have your notebook set up so that you can do the experiment with the notebook only. Okay. All right, so various ways that you can solve this equation. Right. There are four variables in there, so you can solve it for four. You can solve it for ratios. Suppose we want to know the ratio of moles to volume. Right. So you put N over V on one side and the rest of them on the other side. Or you can solve it for R. If we know R and pressure is in uh, atmospheres, this is in moles, and this is in Kelvin, then you can find out uh, at, say, uh, one atmosphere pressure, uh, at one atmosphere pressure at room temperature, or, oh, that's another. What do we mean by STP? There's a gasoline additive, right? No. STP, standard temperature and pressure. So for gases, the standard temperature is zero Celsius, which would be 273 K. And standard pressure is one atmosphere. So if you have only gas problems, those are, if it says standard temperature and pressure, STP, it means zero degrees Celsius or 273 K. For other reactions later, when we talk about reactions where you're going to have the liquids and solids involved, the standard temperature is uh, 20 degrees. So, Don't ask me why. It's the way it is. So if we take standard temperature and pressure and plug them into this equation, pressure, temperature, and say for one mole, how much volume does one mole occupy? Then we use our 0.08206 over here and we can solve for V. I think I've got that maybe on the next slide. No, I know. If you solve for V, you find it's 22.4 liters under those conditions is the standard volume for gas with one mole standard temperature and pressure. All right. So if you look at this problem, you see that it's it's got moles of gas, it's got temperature, it's got volume, but it doesn't have before and after. It's just what is it right now? So that's why we're using the ideal gas equation. And we solve for pressure. We just need to be sure and substitute the proper values. And the values we substitute are based upon the values of the constant liters, atmospheres, moles. Okay. That tells you what these others need to be. Okay. Uh, here's a perfect example. Minus 15C, if you put a minus in there, it's not going to work. Right? So it has to be killed. Because these equations don't do well with negative numbers. Okay, so let's see. I'm about out of time. In, in tradition, I'm going to just keep talking until I finish the recording. If you have to leave, then I understand. Okay. And I am recording this time. I went through a whole lecture at Southern the other day, what recording. So I had to go back and dig in the archives. Uh, let's see. We can use uh, the gas laws for stoichiometry too. Whenever you have a an equation that has a gas involved, calculate the mass of mercury two oxide needed to produce two hundred and twenty cubic centimeters or this many liters of oxygen at twenty five C or two ninety eight K and seven hundred and forty or 0.9737 atmospheres. Okay. So 
how do we get from how do we get from here with this information to there? You got to find moles. It's the only way you can move in an equation. So we use our ideal gas equation to find out how many moles does that represent. Right? We've got volume, we've got pressure, we've got temperature, we've got the ideal gas equation and R value. We can solve for the number of moles. Once you have moles, then you can find out how many moles of this, convert that to mass. So we can use the, the gas equations in stoichiometry also. And that's what this is going to do. Right? That's the number of moles. And then you put the stoichiometry in there, convert it to moles of mercury 2 oxide, and then convert the mercury 2 oxide to grams. There you go. Okay. I think Lavoisier did this experiment. He took mercury 2 oxide and put it in a vessel in magnifying glass and heated it up and it turned into mercury metal and oxygen. He was investigating, you know, what is that stuff? So he put living creatures in there and they survived because there was oxygen. Okay. Um, let's see, what volume of mercury was produced? Well, if you know the mass and you know its density, you can find the volume. Uh, just another solve the equation. Right? It's not much, but it's solvable. Okay, we're going to use this method later in the semester, the Dumas method. We're going to use the gas law to help us determine the molecular weight of a liquid. It has to be a volatile liquid because you've got to turn the liquid into a gas in order to use the gas clause. And we'll talk about this in more detail when it's time to do the experiment. But essentially, um, and this was uh, Jean Baptiste Andre Dumas, not the one that wrote the Three Musketeers, it's a different Dumas. <clears throat> um, come on, here we go. Let's see, that's a lot of his history, and I'm going to leave that out because there's not a whole lot of time. So, if we're going to find the molecular weight, the molecular weight is the mass divided by the number of moles, and the gas that you can find that's derived from that liquid is uh, describable with the ideal gas equation. So, what we're going to do is simplify it. We're going to solve the molecular weight equation for moles and substitute that in here. We're going to take this is equal to that, so we're going to take this. Put it in there. Okay, so when we do that and reduce it, we find that molecular weight is the mass of the gas times R times its temperature divided by its pressure and its volume. So the neat part doing the experiment is figuring out how do we do all these things? How do we how do we do the temperature? How do we do the volume? How do we do the pressure? Right. Once you can do that, and you can actually weigh the gas. Because um, we're going to convert it from the gas back to a liquid, okay, so it doesn't all evaporate, and then measure it and solve it for a molecular weight. Remember when we were talking about um, empirical equation and taking that information and going to um, molecular equation? You need to know the true molecular weight of the compound. This is one way to get it. We don't have to know what the gas is to find out its molecular weight. Okay. If you have to go, go okay. ahead. Yeah. I'll stop for a second, so as you pass, later I can chop that out. <laughs> I'll probably be here for another half hour anyway, so I'm sure you have other things to do. <laughs> we all work. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so for the Zoomers who can hang around, that's fine. <clears throat> uh, here's an example of determining the molecular weight of a gas by the Dumas method. 
And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because, like I said, when we get to the point where we're going to do um, the lab, I'm going to go into more detail with this. Right? So I'm just going to flash this up on the screen. And you've got all the information there in that problem. You substitute in the uh, in the solved equation, and you find that the molecular weight of your gas is 152.98 grams per mole. Okay. So. The ideal gas equation, the IGE, um, can be difficult to use sometimes. But sometimes it's the only way to get where you need to go. Uh, one thing that you ought to do when you're working with gases is be sure if you do nothing else, first step, change temperatures into Kelvin. And then look at your R value, right? What are the units of your R value? For now, it's just gonna be that one, liter atmospheres per mole K, and that will tell you the units of the rest of the equation. The other variables have to match those units. Rearrange the equation how you need it. Right, so, this is the combined equation on the right. Solve for the final volume. And if you take a closer look at this problem, you'll see that you've got before and after temperatures, you've got before and after pressures, and you've got a uh, volume. initial volume so you can solve for the final volume and the way you do that is you're not given the number of moles because the number of moles don't change so that's why this these moles get grayed out or they're canceled okay so here's our our problem where we're decomposing ammonia into nitrogen and hydrogen so what's the final pressure of the system if you start off with 25 cubic feet of ammonia at 400 millimeters of mercury and 25 degrees Celsius, and you heat it to 500 degrees. So you're going from 25 to 500. That tells me that you've got a before and after situation. You don't have to use the ideal gas equation because you know the before and after conditions. Make your conversions, rearrange your equation, right? And here, here, there we go. Final pressure is what we're after. So how do we know the values for moles before and after? You get it from the stoichiometry. The balanced equation coefficients tell you four on this side, two on that side. So that's four final versus two initial. Okay. That's the millimeters of mercury. Did that answer the question? Calculate the final pressure. Must be. Okay. Now we've got another set of laws, Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure. So John Dalton was very active. And determined that when you have a combination, a, a mixture, a solution of gases, each one of those individual gases 
contributes to the overall pressure. How they contribute is Dalton's law of partial pressures. It simply says that the measured pressure, the total, is equal to the individual pressures of each of the gases if they were measured separately in the same container. So the pressure of this gas plus the pressure of that gas plus the pressure of that gas on out to however many gases you have in the mixture. Doesn't matter how many. Add up all these partial pressures and you get the total pressure. Okay. This is another way of expressing it. Notice that if we take this equation and solve it for pressure, we get NRT over V. Okay. So these partial pressures add up. If each one is represented by this term, NRT, 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 then can we cancel some of those terms? The answer is yes, we can. The volume is constant. It's the same volume for total as it is for the individuals. So those volumes go away, they cancel out. We can factor them out and cancel them with the volume on this side because this is the total. R cancels out. We can factor R out of those that expression and cancel it. How about temperature? Temperature is constant. We can factor out temperature. So what are we left with? Well, if we factor out and cancel R, T, and V, all we're left with is moles. So in a gas, the number of total moles equals the moles of each one of the individuals. Okay, and that's good to know. That's why Dalton's law of partial pressure works. Because these pressures are dependent upon the number of moles that are in that volume. And that's Avogadro's law. The more moles of each gas, the higher its pressure. So the partial pressure of each gas is due to how many moles of that gas there are in that containment. Okay. All right. <clears throat> One other thing that we can say about this is the ratio of the moles of each gas to the total. That's known as the mole fraction. So if we were to divide, to divide this equation through, all the way through, by the same value, total, 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 total. Let's stop it here. Just do those three. If we divide those three by total, this one is obviously what? Equal to one, right? What's this one equal to? This one is the mole fraction of that one, right? It's the number of moles of one divided by the total, which is a fraction, less than one. This one, is the mole fraction of two, this one is the mole fraction of three. If you add those up, and you've accounted for every gas in that mixture, then they will add up to one. Those fractions will add up to one. All right. Okay. Um, This is a, an example. <laughs> the reason we say the balanced detonation equation is the fact that this compound is nitroglycerin. So yeah, it will detonate. All you have to do is smack it with a hammer. Um, we're starting with a gas here. 
because it's easier to do the calculations and make the explanation, but at room temperature and pressure, nitroglycerin is a liquid. Right? So we have to get it in the gas phase in order for this to work. Right, so four moles of nitroglycerin will produce 12 moles of carbon dioxide, 10 moles of water, six moles of nitrogen, and one mole of oxygen when it decomposes. And it decomposes like that. Very quickly, it goes from four moles of gas to 12, 22, 28, 29 moles. It goes from four to 29 moles that quick. So that overpressure is what provides the explosive force. There's, there's release of heat too. Okay, so calculate the pressure when nitroglycerin contained in a 100 liter vessel at 25 degrees Celsius and 20 millimeters of mercury detonates and the vessel expands to 110 liters and the temperature rises to 400 degrees C. Okay, that confirms there is heat released. It's going from 25 degrees to 400. Okay, this is a before and after. Yes, a before and after problem. So we've already arranged the equation to find the final pressure. We just need to say, all right, which one of these is which? Initial pressure, initial volume, initial moles, initial temperature. So you can read those off of the problem. The question is, how do you get the moles? The same way we did with the ammonia decomposition. Four moles to start with is the initial moles right here. The final moles, I counted them up just a minute ago, 29, 29 moles of gas at the end. Then you plug in all the other values. So there's your 29 moles final. There's your four moles beginning. And we solve the equation. Cancel units and solve. So the pressure now is 20, 297 millimeters of mercury, as opposed to 20 millimeters of mercury at the beginning. Right? So the pressure, whoa, the pressure went up. In almost 15 times. Okay. So we can also say something else. What's the partial pressure of CO2, H2O, N2, and O2 in that vessel? Well, to find the partial pressure of each gas, what you need is the mole ratio. Remember, add up the moles, you get the total moles. And those are in the same ratio as the mole fraction. So if we say 12 divided by 29 is the mole fraction for carbon dioxide, and this is the total pressure at the end, then the contribution of carbon dioxide is that fraction of this total. And there it is, 123 millimeters of mercury is due to the presence of carbon dioxide. And you can do that for each one. Water is less, nitrogen is a little less, and oxygen is almost nothing. Okay, add those up and you should get the final pressure. We were close. Calculation errors, right? rounding errors. 297.59 versus 297.61. Okay, now we're going to introduce the kinetic molecular theory. Right? Up to this point, we've just been talking about laws. Right? This is what happens when you do that. That's it. Right? No explanation why. The kinetic molecular theory is a way of explaining why these laws work, All right? So, and along with this theory, we have a model. So these are the basic postulates for the theory. You have large numbers of molecules that are involved in this confined gas. 
very large numbers. The size of the particles is almost insignificant compared to the distance between them. So this little tiny molecule, its next nearest neighbor is way over here, by comparison. These gas particles are in constant rapid motion. And they do collide with one another. They collide with one another. They also collide with the walls of the container. That's why we get measurable pressures. And we also have to assume, because we can't measure each individual molecule and its motion, its mass, and calculate its kinetic energy, we have to say something about the average kinetic energy for all of the molecules in that container. And we assume that if at a given temperature, the average kinetic energy for all the molecules in there is the same. Right? We know there's a spread, of course, but at a given temperature, and temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of any substance, including gases. And we have to assume that all the molecules in that gas behave ideally. In other words, when they smack into each other, uh, there's no loss of kinetic energy. It's perfectly elastic collision. And there's no interaction. There's no attraction. There's no repulsion except for the collision itself. Okay. So when we talk about kinetic energy, how do we express it and how do we measure it for our gas? Well, we're going to use an analogy. We're going to use seven bowling balls. And each one weighs five kilograms. Okay. The kinetic energy, E sub K, or I write KE, E sub K equals one half mv squared. So if we know the mass, five kilograms, we need to know its velocity. So let's say of these seven balls, they each have a different velocity. And we calculate the uh, energy in terms of kilograms for mass, meters per second, for a velocity, which is squared, so kilogram meter squared per second squared is a joule. All right, that's, it's a, uh, an equivalence, a derived value, a derived unit of measure from the SI system. Okay, knowing that, we can get these seven balls and each one is moving at a different velocity and for convenience sake, we're just starting at 10 and we're incrementing up 10 for each one. So we'll go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and 70. And we calculate the energy for each one, right? Using this equation. And the units of measure then come out as joules, right? So this one is moving slower, so it has less energy. And 70 is moving faster, so it has more energy. Okay. Now, First thing we're going to do is calculate the average velocity, the average speed of the balls, right? So it's simple, just 70 plus 60 plus 50 plus 40 plus 30 plus 20 plus 10 divided by seven. There you go. So the average speed is 40 meters per second. Now, if we use that velocity or that speed in our equation, for one of the balls, which weighs five kilograms, and do that calculation, what energy are we gonna get? Oops. Oh, I jumped ahead of myself, pardon me. First, let's calculate what is the average kinetic energy based upon our calculations, right? So we take each, this list, and take the average there. Here we are, 
So the average is 5,000 joules is the average kinetic energy based upon that calculation. But what if we take 40 meters per second and the five kilograms and say, what is the kinetic energy of that ball with that average velocity? Okay. Now, there I go again. We could do it that way. In fact, let's do it that way. All right, so the kinetic energy equals one half mass, five kilograms, and the average velocity is 40 meters per second squared. So let's see what that value would be. Let's see. 40 squared, which times? I get 4,000 joules. Four thousand joules, but we just calculated the average kinetic energy based upon this list at five thousand joules. So, you know, what gives? What's wrong with this picture? You can't use simple average velocity to do the calculation. It doesn't work. What velocity would work? Well. If we take that value and set it equal to this equation and then solve for the velocity, what would you get? That's what this is doing right here. This is a rearranged equation to find the velocity based upon this average kinetic energy. Right, so when we solve that equation, we get 44.72. 44.72 meters per second, not 40. If we substitute that one in there, we get 5,000. Okay. So we went to all this trouble to explain that the average velocity, the arithmetic average, is not the right average for our collection of particles in a gas. What we need is what's called the root mean square. The root mean square RMS. Okay, I'm gonna show you how to get it. Um, let me see, if I get ahead of myself. Okay, let's hold off on this slide for just a second. The root mean square is a way of averaging those speeds, those velocities, to give you that number. So if we have a list of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and 70. To get the root mean square for this list, you go backwards, root mean square. So you take the square of each one. 100, 400, 900, 1600, 2500, 3600, and 4900. That's say this is a velocity, this is a velocity squared. Okay. Then we take the mean of this value of these values. Right? Let's do that. 100 plus 400 plus 900 plus 1600 plus 2500. 3,600 and 4,900, okay? Then I divide that total by seven, okay? 
and I get 2,000. Okay. That's the mean. This is the squared values. This is the mean. Now what we need to do, because look, this was meters per second. This is meters squared per second squared. This is meters squared per second squared. We got to get rid of those squares. Otherwise, we can't clean velocity. So now what you do is take the root, the root of the mean of the squares. That's where RMS comes from. All right, so let's take the square root of that. And that's equal to 44.72 meters per second. Okay. <clears throat> now, let's look at this in terms of the kinetic molecular theory of gases. By the way, the kinetic molecular theory started off with gases, but it was uh, readily transformed into an understanding of liquids and solids also. So consider a particle in the box that has random motion. What's the energy of that particle? Well, what we need is the energy of the particle in this axis, and in this axis, and in this axis. That's what we're doing here. X-axis, Y-axis, Z-axis. The energy of that particle is one half M. Uh, that's uh, the Greek letter mu, which is the velocity in, uh, specific for that axis. Okay, now we need to know the kinetic energy for all of the particles, say a mole of the particles. The root mean square velocity is the velocity of a particle based upon the kinetic energy of all the particles, not based upon the velocity of the individual particles. Okay, and I just showed you how to do it. So the root mean square velocity for an average particle is this uh, mean of the squares. That mean that bar should be over the two also. That's an error. Should look like this. Like that. Because you take the squares and then you take the mean of the squares and then the square root of the mean. Okay. All right, so we can't we can't actually measure um, the velocities of every particle in the gas. It's just impossible. So we have a formula that serves that purpose. And this root mean square velocity is equal to the square root of three times R value times T temperature Kelvin divided by the molecular weight or the molar mass of the gas and then take the square root of all that. Now, I said we were going to only be using 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole K. We do have to use this other version of the ARP simply because we need the energy of it. So 8.3145 joule per mole K uh, is the, the value that we use for this R right here. And that value is in useful information, so you don't have to memorize it. You just need to recognize it. Uh, primarily based upon the units, joules per mole K. Okay. So what's the, uh, the average velocity of the air molecule at 37 degrees? Well, the average molecular weight for air is a weighted average, just like we, we did for uh, molar masses of um, 
elements, we weight the average in favor of nitrogen. All right, so we take nitrogen and oxygen primarily, and we come out with this many grams per mole, or kilograms per mole. Why do we need kilograms? Because of the R value. Kilograms is the fundamental unit of mass. So we have to convert to kilograms per mole. Okay. So our, our formula is square root of 3RT over molecular weight. We just substitute those values. Notice that here's three. Here's the uh, R value. And notice that we've got different units in here. I don't know if I showed you this before, but I'm going to do it again. Um, oh, no, it's wrong. That's the wrong one. Uh, energy equals one half mv squared. Okay, so if energy is in joules and mass is in kilograms and velocity squared is in meters squared per second squared, then joules, if we substitute that into our R value, this is kilogram meter squared per second squared, right? That's the joule right there. These units here with that one. Joules per mole K. That's why it looks like that. And we need that because we can cancel K easily enough, but we can't cancel the molar mass, right? Unless we have it changed here. Kilograms cancel kilograms. Moles cancel moles, and what do you have left? Once you take the square root, now you have meters per second. That gives you uh, velocity. All right, so 516 meters per second for air is the average velocity of each of the molecules in the air. Uh, convert that to miles per hour. Right, 1155 miles per hour. Uh, that's greater than the speed of sound. Right, speed of sound, depending on where you are in the atmosphere, is in the neighborhood of 700 miles per hour. So these molecules are moving faster than the speed of sound. <clears throat> what if we substitute helium in there instead of air? Right, helium weighs a lot less. What's going to happen to the velocity at that temperature? With a smaller mass, you got to be going faster to have the same energy. So we should expect the velocity for helium to be much higher than it is for air. And we make the substitution and find out it is much higher, 1,390 meters per second instead of 500. A lot, lot, lot higher. Okay, that's the kinetic molecular theory of gases. Now we want to look at one other law, Graham's law of diffusion or effusion. Either one is proper. It takes into account the uh, average kinetic energy of the gas, and it also introduces that molecular weight term. So let's say we have two gases, gas A and gas B, and they're both at the same temperature. If we ratio their velocities, right, but just make a quotient out of it, right? Velocity of A divided by velocity of B, we know how to calculate that because we have that equation, the square root of 3RT over molecular weight. Uh, let's see, we're going to multiply both numerator and denominator by T, which is time. If we do that, that gives us, um, if it's moving at a certain velocity and over the same amount of time, 
they move different distances, do they not? Right? Different velocities, different distances. So the distance for A is this, distance for B is that. Because this is meters per second times seconds is meters. So this will be in meters divided by meters for A and B. Okay. But we also know that this velocity is equal to 3RT divided by the molecular weight of A. And this one is 3RT divided by the molecular weight of B. And the square root is over the whole thing. It could be over individual, right? But then math says you can make the square root over the whole thing. So what we're gonna do is say, all right, we cancel the threes. Rs are the same, they're at the same temperature. So these, this term, these terms right here cancel out. Now let's rearrange it. All right, so now the ratio of the velocity of A to the velocity of B is equal to the square root of the molecular weight of B divided by the molecular weight of A. So what good is that? Well, now that if we know the molecular weight of A and we can uh, ratio the distance it travels versus the distance that B travels at the same temperature, then we can say something about the molecular weight of B. It's another way of determining the molar mass of a gas without knowing what the gas is. So if we have hydrogen chloride and ammonia, which are different molar masses, this is a demonstration. We put them in the end of, of a tube, and I got a picture for you in a second, uh, in cotton balls, and they, they drift because of their speed of movement, and they meet. Where they meet, ammonia and HCl will produce ammonium chloride, and it forms a cloud at the point where they meet. Well, the ratio of the distance that they travel is also equal to the ratio of their molecular weights under the square root. So there you go, the distance based on that earlier equation is ratioed there to the molecular weight and take the square root. Okay. So what we're doing here is we're using their true molecular weights to calculate the ratio of the distance that one moves over the other. And we find out that ammonia moves about 46% farther than hydrogen chloride does in the same amount of time at the same temperature. What does that look like? Uh, let's see. Here it is. Okay, so there's your two. And we've got ammonia on one side here, moving farther distance than hydrogen chloride. And that's how you, you tell the distance that they move so that you could actually put the values in here. And if you know one of these, you can calculate the other one. And it doesn't, you don't have to know. All you have to do is be able to find some way to find out where they meet in the middle. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see, here we have ammonia with a different gas, and we don't know what the gas is, but we do know the distance that, that ammonia moves, and then the distance that the other one moved is uh, the total distance minus how far it moved. So the ratio there is 2.78, and that's equal to the unknown gas divided by the known, take square root. 
Okay, so we're just going to solve for the molecular weight of the unknown gas. There it is, 127 grams per mole. So if we have these to choose from, we find that hydrogen iodide is the closest one to our experimental value. Okay, practical application of Graham's law. I was a kid growing up in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Most people nowadays, you know, that just, that's just the name of another town. But when I was growing up, everybody knew that Oak Ridge, Tennessee was one of the pivotal locations for the development of the atomic bomb. There were some other locations. There was uh, um, Hanford, Washington, uh, was instrumental. And there was a place on the Savannah River in Georgia also. I can't remember what that one was called. But <clears throat> uh, at that time, Oak Ridge, Tennessee had the highest concentration of PhD chemists and engineers in the, in the country because they were there to do research and uh, develop technologies for purifying uranium. Uranium is a mixture of principally these two isotopes. But most of it is this one, which is no good for making a bomb or using it for nuclear power. You need this one. You need a way to purify it. And there are several ways that were under investigation. One of them used Graham's law. Notice that they would have different molecular weights, different molar masses. Why? Because they're different isotopes. This one's heavier than that one. Okay? So, what you have to do, uranium is a metal. And it takes a lot of energy to turn it into a gas. So what they did was they converted it into the fluoride. Hexafluoride. Now, at a lower temperature, they can get it into a gas. Now they've got this mixture. And what they do is, under pressure, they force it through a membrane with very, very, very tiny pores. In fact, the membrane has to be made out of Teflon because this gas is extremely corrosive. Stainless steel won't work. They'll eat it up. So they use Teflon. And as the gas moves through that small orifice, this one moves faster than that one. So you get a slight concentration of uranium-235 on the other side of the membrane. And you just put another membrane and keep pushing them through. And every membrane they go through, you get an enrichment of this isotope until you go through thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And you end up with 95% uh, uranium. And that's good enough for a bomb. Okay, <clears throat> U-235 is 0.72% of, um, of the purified uranium that was available at the time. And you notice from this equation that the difference in velocities is very, very small. That's why it takes thousands of membranes to accomplish that purification, that uh, enrichment. Okay, there was a plant in Oak Ridge. I'll show you a picture in just a minute. 
um, that was devoted to this production and nothing else. It was a huge building. It had to be because of all the membranes that were being used, thousands of them. Um, and by the way, I'll give you credit, give credit to uh, Dr. Roy Plunk, who invented Teflon. He came along, uh, let's see, in 1938. So Teflon was a brand new material. And it came along just at the right time because we needed it to make this process work. Okay, the plant was K25. That was the name of the plant, K25. There were several other plants. They were working on different technologies, but this one, notice, it was massive. In fact, as a kid, uh, my family wasn't that rich, so for entertainment, we would hop in the car and drive around the plant. It had a chain link fence with armed guards and all that stuff, but you could drive the service road around it, and it would take you 15 to 20 minutes to drive around the place. Forty-four acre footprint, and if you want to know more about the plant, go to this website, and it'll give you all the information you need. Okay, one last topic. We've been talking about ideal gases up till now, but if the conditions are not quite right for the ideal, in other words, temperatures are too low. Uh, pressures are too high, or you have lots of gas crammed into a small space. Then you need correction factors to, to make the ideal gas equation work. Well, we give credit uh, to Van der Waals. I think he was Danish. Um, maybe not. He might have been German. He probably was German. He got a Nobel Prize for his work on this equation. Notice that PV, let's see, PVNRT. So the correction factors he introduced were for pressure and volume. Um, and this is a correction for the pressure, this is the correction for the volume, and you don't have to know these, I'm just making a point that um, you can still use the ideal gas equation uh, if at these extreme conditions, if you take into account these correction factors, okay? And that's it for gases. Oop, 45 minutes over.